From the founding of the Revenue Cutter Service to the present, the military aspect of the Coast Guard has been unmistakable. Alexander Hamilton emphasized the need for commissioned officers in this naval service. Until the Navy was reestablished in 1797, it was the nation's only naval service for the first few years of its existence. The need for naval rank and status required visible symbols of authority, so some sort of standardization uniform was the result. The history of these uniforms reflects both traditions and the roles of the Revenue Cutter Service and the Coast Guard, as well as the fashions of the period. Captain William Cook seizes contraband gold near Brunswick, North Carolina in 1793. Cook commanded the Revenue Cutter Diligence, one of the first 10 cutters built for the service. The cutter service at this time had no ensign or official uniform. Many officers wore the Revolutionary War uniforms as pictured in the painting to the left. Samuel Chester Reed, privateer officer, War of 1812. Prior to the 1830s, little is known of the Revenue Service uniforms. There was much latitude given to officers and they often wore Navy uniforms. It was also possible for officers to hold commissions in both the Navy and the Revenue Service and wear the same uniform for both. Some early descriptions of revenue officers mention a high hat or round hat pictured here. Such an outfit and hat was often worn by merchant vessel officers. Captain Alexander V. Fraser, Captain Commandant of the Revenue Cutter Service from 1842 until 1847 in the uniform of the period. Lieutenant Henry Harwood Key, Revenue Marine one of the earliest photographs of a revenue officer. This picture is dated from the mid-1850s. He wears two epaulets, authorized in 1853 for all three lieutenant grades. Note the sword. This was called the most handsome sword ever authorized for the service. The three buttons on the sleeve also indicate rank. This photo courtesy of the Maryland Historical Society. Third Lieutenant, U.S. Revenue Marine, Civil War era. The coat was the frock identical to the Navy uniform of the era. Note the shield and the anchor device on the hat and shoulder straps. Straps were for undress, epaulets were for dress. Another uniform from the Civil War period. Note the differences between this uniform and the previous one. Rank is shown on the sleeve with stripes rather than buttons. Ship's officer, circa 1900. Note that the sleeve braid indicating rank is dark, except for worn officers. Engineering officers have an embroidered, four-bladed matching the fly front edging. In 1908, this dark color was changed to gold and a propeller on the collar. Captain Francis Tuttle of the Revenue Cutter Bear in the fly front uniform coat. This coat was authorized in 1891 Apparently facial hair was not regulated in this era. A fly front coat remained standard until around the First World War. A typical enlisted crew aboard a revenue cutter circa 1890. The traditional naval sailor suit went without a major change for a century or more. Note the petty officers in the front row and the rating badge on the right sleeve of the third sailor from the right in the middle row. The rating on his badge is not identified. The crew of a revenue cutter circa 1910. The P on the bow of the boat indicates that this was probably the revenue cutter Pamlico, home ported on the Atlantic coast. Note the shoulder knot on the commanding officer, first row right. The white duck cap was first authorized in the 1891 regulations, and this is one of the earliest photos showing them in use. Coast Guardsman at Fort Trumbull, Connecticut, 1917, in the Navy style uniform. Captain Francis Saltus Van Boskirk, shown here in his white dress uniform after his appointment to First Lieutenant, August 4th, 1902. He's the author of Semper Paratus. He wrote the words in the cabin of the Cutter Yamacraw in Savannah, Georgia in 1922. He wrote the music five years later on a beat up old piano in Unalaska, Alaska. Coast Guard officers during the Prohibition era. The double-breasted coat left 
was similar to that of the Navy in World War I. It was originally patterned after the Royal Navy's jacket. The peacoat on the right has long been a standard item of the sea services. Coast Guard uniforms of World War II. The male enlisted uniform was identical to the Navy's. The female uniform was like the Navy's except for the service emblems. The lapel devices were crossed anchors under the Coast Guard emblem. The spar uniform of World War II was similar to the Navy's uniform. Notice the Coast Guard emblems on the jacket lapels. A class of spars graduate from the Reserve Training Center in Yorktown, Virginia in 1972. The basic design of the uniform has generally remained the same. Old and new Coast Guard uniforms from the 1970s. This uniform marked the first major change from the traditional sailor suit. The shade of blue was distinctive from other shades used by other services. A variety of Coast Guard uniform from left, service dress white, tropical blue, service dress blue, winter dress blue, camouflage utility uniform, operational dress uniform. A showcase of Coast Guard uniforms, beginning with the Revenue Cutter Service up through the present day dress, during the 14th Coast Guard District by Central Ball. Each uniform was highlighted and a short historical narrative was presented. 